You can be seated. Well, other than sore muscles, I'm thankful there was no major injuries yesterday. Uh, but let's pray together, can we, for everyone that was there yesterday. Uh, we have a lot of visitors. And let's pray that we'll continue as a church to connect with our community, uh, to reach out to those whom the Holy Spirit is drawing. And I'm so thankful for each person that's here today. And if you are a visitor, you're welcome. We're just going to pause here for a moment and uh, pray for the uh, pray for what God is doing in this community. Uh, we'll continue to pray for Lorna and for Lucille. And for, I noticed that Rosemary is not here today. Let's pray for her. Uh, but so thankful that Darlette only had some pulled muscles. Could have been much worse. It could have happened. There was another person that was just batting the ball and running for first base. I don't know how many even saw. I won't say who it was. But embarrassing, she tripped and fell and could have been hurt badly. And not an injury, not a scrape. So thank the Lord. Um, that there's no major uh, troubles from yesterday. Uh, let's pray together, can we? Father, I thank you for today. Thank you for your presence here with us. And Father, all the fun that we had, all the joy that we shared with our children, I just pray that the children will grow up with the idea in their mind that this game, this community, the sharing that we have together is more valuable than anything else the world has to offer. I pray, Father, that we would also share that kind of love openly with the community so that people will see that you are the one true God and that your kingdom is the greatest place to be. I pray, Father, for all those that visited yesterday and all those that joined in, and I pray, Father, that each of our hearts will be drawn closer to you and the wonder of you. Thank you for all the fun that we had and all the joy again. And Father, I pray for those who couldn't be there, either there yesterday or here today, uh, those set aside with uh, colds and flu. We remember Kim and, and Linnell and her daughters. And uh, Father, I pray as well for Lucille and, and Lorna. I just pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would be with each of them. And Father, as we worship you today, I just pray that the Holy Spirit would gather around Rosemary and uh, Lucille and Lorna, just as if they were sitting here with us. May that same presence and peace that we feel here with us be granted to them. And Father, as we go out from this place, may we go in joy. We pray for Muriel as she's getting ready for baptism. Father, fill her full of the joy and presence of the Holy Spirit. And may our hearts continue to live in that same joy and spirit that we feel uh, right here, right now, throughout this week. Touch each heart, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed by believing in him. Anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust in him has long, long since been under the death sentence without knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in the one of a kind, God of, Son of God, when introduced to him. This is a crisis wherein God light streamed into the world. 
but men and women everywhere ran for, for the darkness. They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial and illusion, hates God light and won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. But anyone working and living in the true and reality welcomes God light so the work can be seen for the God work it is. Thank you, Jana. And I pray for a day when young men like that will be lined up here to read scripture. I'm so thankful that we have the young people and the children that we have connected here with our church. And I love seeing young people growing up. And uh, Paul must have been getting near my age when he wrote the words, I write to you young men because you're strong. Some of my age... Going back to yesterday, some people my age, you know, don't realize it. And then Sunday morning comes and things aren't quite functioning the way they were before the game. But I'm so glad that, uh, that God is here with us today. And uh, I think my excuse, I'm not sure it is age, I think it's just out of shape. And uh, I'm thankful that I've had a chance to be a little bit more active the last couple of weeks, so... Uh, anyway, it's good to be here, but if I do make any nasty faces, it's nothing to do with you that I'm looking at you. It might be just that I turned a little bit and felt something. And then I know I'm not Jamin's age, even though I, I, he had a good hit there yesterday, and uh, he didn't seem to have any trouble at all coming up here today. <laughs> it's so good to be here. And I'd like to welcome the community online. Um, the, uh, the family fun day that we had, I wish that some of the people around the world that are watching us could have been there and they'd understand all the laughter and, and jokes and everything back and forth. But all jokes aside, there's a time that comes when people, even in joking around, can hurt one another. And sometimes it becomes serious and people really get hurt. And there was, I had a friend, a co-worker at one time that used to say it's all fun and games until somebody gets a black eye. Well, what happens when somebody hurts one another? What happens when somebody does something terrible that destroys somebody else? If you were the judge, how would you judge? Think about some of these things. What about a murderer? Somebody that interrupts somebody's life and destroys the core of that family as they lose a family member. What about a rapist? What about a child abuser? How would you judge? How, how do you judge when you look in the paper? What about somebody that abuses a spouse, their wife, their husband, that one who should be the closest that one who should be the closest person of trust gets hurt. What then? What about people in business that do something that harms another person's business and don't follow the rules of ethics and fair play and somebody gets hurt? What then? What about people that steal during natural disasters. We had some terrible flooding before we moved here, and the St. John River flooded, and people were evacuated for safety, and there were three gentlemen that took a boat, something like the Mawson boats here, and went up and down the river and took boatload after boatload after boatload, cleaned out house after house after house, and thankfully got caught when they tried to invade a home where there was a guy big enough to rip them in half. But he was a kind man and didn't. Called 911 and they were apprehended. What about those terrible things we hear around the world 
If you could judge, how would you? You see, from God's point of view, anyone who makes a mistake is guilty. That's true. And when you're the victim, it's pretty easy to say. They're guilty. So what then? Is it game over? Is it that you're no longer accepted? Is it that trust is broken? You can never measure up again? The Bible says all have sinned. That means us. That means me. That means you. That means we don't have a chance. I'm just so thankful that God is not only holy and just. He is also perfectly loving. And God, from his point of view, didn't come down to earth. He didn't send his one and only son in the world to point a finger at you or at me. He sent his one and only son in the world to do something very special. Let me tell you a story. I'm not sure how many remember or how many even heard the detail of what happened in South Africa just a few decades ago. I was a teenager, and I was very interested in language. The word sanction always meant something very, very positive. I sanctioned that. I agreed to something. And I watched as that word was transferred to mean something brand new. The countries of the world gathered together and said, South Africa, what you're doing is wrong. You're oppressing 70 or whatever it was, 80 or 90 percent of the people were being oppressed into a, a kind of slavery that was terrible. They hardly had enough to eat, hardly had a place to live, while the minority, the white people, lived in rich um, comfort. The, kind of, the world rose up in anger and they sanctioned an agreement that said, they would blockade all trade with South Africa. Well, you might think, well, that would fix them. Shut the country down. I can tell you this. It got much worse before it got better. Instead of saying, I give up. Instead of saying, we better go along with what the world's saying. They became the minority that were in power. Became very oppressive. And began to take their anger and frustration out on the population. The things that they did were some were unspeakable. Unspeakable. I cried as I read some things that were taking place. And I didn't read the full detail, thankfully, until I was in Bible college. I began to go back and research that because of something very unique that happened that's coming up right away. And if you don't know what happened at, when that all settled down, you'll understand how different the world can be with something called justice. See, the justice they sought was a transitional justice. They didn't go when it was all over and the white people had been ousted from power and law and order began to be restored. They didn't then take all the people who had done the oppressive, oppressive acts. They did something very special. I'll tell you a little story that I wrote, an exact um, account of what happened in a court of law. The courts were set up. They were much like the war crime, crimes trials that were held in Nuremberg after World War II. The courts, which were done district by district in that country, um, they have a little bit different justice system than we had than we have here. But as people were brought in one by one to face charges, a little woman approached the magistrate. Her oppressor had been caught. She accused this white man, a young man in his 20s or 30s, of dragging her husband 
and son into the yard and murdering them in front of her. Now she was a widow. She wasn't only poor. She wasn't only weak. She was a widow. She wasn't only a widow. She, she had lost her home. They destroyed her home. They took her land. She was left with nothing. And as she stood in court that day, the judge found that man guilty. And she faced him. And the story goes that she collapsed as he was declared guilty. And as they were able to tend to her and care for her, the judge passed the sentence. It was the first of what would be many great justice promotions in that country. He said, Sir, you took that woman's husband and his wealth and her wealth. You took everything she needed to live, so you must take her home and care for her. You killed that woman's son, so I want you to ask her forgiveness and be her son as long as she lives. And he turned to the woman and said, I want you to forgive him and accept him as your son. We must let this go behind us or there will be no end to the retributions. There will be no end to what's going on. They had learned, they had decided as a court system that they would have restorative justice. And that restorative justice was to settle things. Some of the people in the world, some of the uh, justice leagues and so on, spoke out against it. And still, they wrote against it. But a man named Nelson Mandela wrote a paper. And he described what restorative justice did for that country. He described years later how it put that country back on its feet. Until FIFA was able to take a World Cup soccer event there in brand new stadiums that were built by people that were back to work in a country that was destitute and destroyed. It was the first time I heard of Vuvuzela, and I was cheering every time I heard that sound because of what God had done through a secular court system that had been influenced by a little-known black church leader who became a bishop Desmond Tutu is now a household name around the world. He was the one who influenced that court system, along with Nelson Mandela and some others, to say we need to let things settle. We need to find a justice that will bring peace to our land. I can tell you what the alternative would have been. Because justice that brings justice it's called an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And all that that kind of justice brings is a bunch of blind, toothless people around the world. God being God went much further. I'm forever in awe of a God who would not only make friends with friends, not only love someone next to him, but would love his enemies. And so he sent his one and only son into the world. It was like I read John 3 for the first time this week. The last couple of weeks I've just been messed up reading how God was not only coming to the broken, the people who visibly, visibly needed God to come. But on that night as he spoke to Nicodemus, one of the 70 most religious people in the country of Israel, a people who were known to be the people of God, he spoke to that religious person who thought he was doing everything right and said, you must be born from above. You must be born over. And it must be from above. Not an earthly birth. That you live and grow. And try to do the best you can. And try to follow the rules. And be everything you can be. 
but you must be born of the water and of the Spirit. And until we confess Jesus Christ as our Savior, we're missing what God wants us to do. We think that accepting to be the best we can be is enough. But it's not. Our best efforts, the Bible teaches, fall short of what God wants. And so, He sent His Son into the world. And as He sent His Son into the world, He accepted us as we are. But He also gives us a chance to start again. See, that's what it means to be born from above. We start over. It's a do-over. It's like a video game where we reboot and start brand new. Just as if we never played before. Except now, we not only have the ability to play the game over, we have all the cheat codes and we can beat that game with God's help. It's not cheating. It's supernatural and that's, it's the Holy Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit who wants to come in and live inside us and not only give us transformative justice where we're changed into a brand new creature. He gives us the power to live a new life that's totally different. He can even give us the power to forgive if we've been a victim. Just as He forgave, He calls us to forgive the same way. Just as He gave up the right to justice, He asks us, to forgive. That grace and peace that he offers us is beyond our reach and yet he offers it freely. That's what he asks us to do. And the only thing, the only thing that can keep us from becoming transformed into a new creature is our personal choice to not accept it. I can't believe that there's an offer like that standing that people will not run to and grab. That's the gospel we need to share. It's good news that goes beyond all our faults. It's good news that goes beyond all our hurts. It's good news that goes beyond all our brokenness. And just as South Africa did not have to go through civil war, historians say clearly that if any other justice had been meted out in that context, there would have been absolute civil war, there would have been bloodshed in the tens and hundreds of thousands before it was over. Because the minority, the white people, had the weapons and the majority were tired that they were done. And even though that was civil courts, the principle was a godly principle of restorative justice. God goes beyond that and wants to transform us within our world so that we can make amends for the wrong we've done, so that we can offer forgiveness for the hurts we've received, and that we can live again a brand new life that changes not only us, but our world around us. Because God is able to do that through us. Not because we're good enough, but because He does it through us by His love and by His Spirit. And that is the Gospel. If you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, I'd like to call you to that today. And in a few moments, we're going to close. I'm going to ask Karen to pray over the food after I'm done. But right now, I'd like everyone to just close their eyes. And if you're that kind of person that bows your head when you pray, you're welcome to bow your head with no one looking around. I'd like to ask if there's anyone here that's never accepted that grace and that mercy that transformative justice that God offers to us. If you've never accepted that into your life, I call you to do that now. 
And you can do that just by simply raising a hand and saying, I'll accept to allow God, God to work in my life. The sinner's prayer that I prayed was, God, I've messed my life up royally. It'll take a God to fix it. I dare you. And I dare you to dare God to do that today. If you'd raise your hand right now, I can lead you in a prayer to accept Him as your Savior. If you haven't done that. Let's pray. And if you even didn't raise your hand, I'll lead you in a prayer. And then Karen can close us in prayer. Pray over the food. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this amazing good news that you offer into our broken world. And if there's anyone here that would come to you and accept your transformative justice, your salvation, a justice that changes who we are no matter what we've done. If there's anyone here, let them pray with me now. As many years ago I prayed and watched my life transform. May they pray with me now. Father God, I recognize that without you, I'm lost. I've done things that I could never undo. I've hurt people I could never unhurt. There's things that I've been hurt that I could never forgive on them. But Father God, I trust you to make everything right. I surrender my life to you and ask you to change my heart and make me new inside that I be born from above. I pray this in Jesus' name.